Sahar is coming from Stockholm now, where yes. <laughs> she has been uh, giving a speech uh, in front of our king. Yes. And now she's here. <laughs> 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 and we would love to, to hear just a little bit uh, on what you did more in Stockholm. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, please. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, yeah, in Stockholm it was uh, quite an experience. Uh, I was invited to um, the Swedish Royal Palace to speak in, uh, as uh, I was the keynote speaker uh, at uh, the Young Leadership Seminar uh, with, under the, the sponsorship of His Majesty King Carl Gustav. And um, spent uh, the entire day with, uh, with His Majesty, with Prince Daniel and with His Excellency uh, Jan Eliasson, uh, the uh, Deputy um, uh, General of the, of the United Nations, Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, I'm very happy that um, my speech was extremely well received. I'm still receiving very good feedback up till now. I spoke about the leadership inspiration I gained from simple Egyptians in Tahrir Square. Uh, and gave some examples from my, my Arab and Muslim heritage on leadership that, that could be um, a source of inspiration uh, for the global community uh, in addition to the, the, the Arab uh, youth. Um, you know, under oppression, leadership is forbidden because, because it's a direct threat to, to a dictator. And so right now, while we are uh, rediscovering our, our own voice and finding our feet, we're also rediscovering um, the inspiration in our heritage um, that could be, uh, you know, that could help us learn from our past to address the problems of our future. And this, this was the main theme uh, of my speech. You can find it on my Facebook. I, I have put, uh, I've put it online on Scribd because a lot of people in, in the seminar uh, have asked me to, to see the, the text until the video is available. Uh, all the information and the pictures and so on you can find on my Facebook and you'll get the link at, at the end of this lecture and I welcome uh, continued communication and you're most welcome to send me emails, uh, participate on my pages and uh, continue the discussion we have here today. Um, I have 45 minutes for this speech and I had two alternatives. Either cut it a bit short to give you a long Q&A session within my 45 minutes or abuse my, <laughs> my opportunity and, and pack it with information because I know that the media is not the fairest of judges when it comes to representing my part of the world. So I'm taking the second option. I'm going to probably be using the whole 45 minutes in, in um, giving you a lot of different uh, uh, perspectives on, on, on the revolution and on my part of the world. I, I, don't worry, it's not going to be boring. There's a lot of audiovisuals involved. And then um, at dinner or at coffee and online and so on, you're most welcome to continue the communication with me as long as you like. As you know, I, I come from Egypt. I, I'm now coming from Stockholm, but I live in Cairo. And this huge change that is happening in uh, the Middle East, uh, the Arab world and, and the world, starting from Tahrir Square, is definitely something that needs a lot of looking into from all, the, all types of researchers, particularly those interested in sociopolitical changes and, and psychological changes, in addition to, of course, uh, political evolution and this kind of thing. Um, it, it's definitely a life-changing experience. I'm not one of the movers and shakers of the revolution, but I just took part, like millions of other Egyptians. At one point, there were about 20 million Egyptians on the street at the same time, and this is how we ousted Mubarak. And so I was just a dot in the ocean. I'm, I'm not really a big leader of the revolution or anything like that. My main focus is communication and human developments. And so from this perspective, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, different types of, of ideas related to the theme of this conference. Um, my focus today is the role of the children in the revolution, how they changed their self-image, how they um, led the adults to, to treat them differently because their awareness is evolving in an incredible way that I'm going to illustrate a little bit here in, in this presentation and then you can go on from there. Um, their creative self-expression was astonishing for me because, uh, as, as you will discover as we go on, we don't learn this in school and actually our education system is designed to kill creativity and innovation. And so the way they, they have found a way around that and have evolved really astonished me. And this is one of the things I'm going to be showing you today. I will also discuss the importance of a global connection between the international children of the world and how this can affect our world um, very deeply 
uh, in, in the long run, I have um, a, a cross-cultural communication project called Don't Hate Educate. And within it, we have many initiatives uh, directed at different types of people. Uh, one of them is a school project. Uh, I tried to connect between children in, in Egyptian schools and children in Scandinavian schools. And I will tell you a little bit about that as we go. The project is called Talk to Me. Uh, and it was quite a successful project and uh, we have a site, you have the pictures there and all the details that you can look at after the lecture. Let's first start with the, with the context of the huge sociopolitical changes that are taking place in Egypt. Since yesterday I've been hearing many of you talk about post-colonialism um, and it's very interesting for me that most who spoke before me, or actually all of them, to me, come from a Western background. They all belong to Europe, North America, and Australia. And so when they talk about post-colonialism, they address it from one side of the issue. Now I'm going to give you the other side of the issue, which is the, 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 the point of view of the colonialized countries. Egypt is one of the most colonialized countries in the world. Throughout our 10,000 years of history, we have had tiny times when we were actually ruled by ourselves. Most of the time we were occupied by somebody else. Um, we can actually debate, basically, the term itself. Are we really in a post-colonial age? From our perspective, a lot of Egyptian and Arab scholars are actually wondering whether colonialism has actually ended in our part of the world. In Arabic, the, world, the word colonialism is synonymous with occupation. And so, if you try to explain the term in Arabic, you end up trying to see whether or not the lands are occupied. And occupation doesn't have to be military. It doesn't have to be physical occupation. Um, it was very interesting for me to, to listen to those who talked about globalization. And again, you were talking about globalization from your side of the issue, whereas the countries that were occupied at one point in time by a different culture and a different people and a different perspective have lost some of their identity and some of their culture and struggle now to regain it. So there is a, a debate where I come from on whether or not we're actually in a post-colonial stage of our history. Um, let me explain a little further with a map. Look at this map. This is the map of Africa. And as you can see from the legend of the map here, I'm sorry. As you can see from the legend of the map, these are the names of the countries that are occupying, have occupied Africa at one time. So try to see whether you see at all any independent part of Africa. It's entirely occupied or was occupied at one point in time. And you can imagine what happens when an African who is, for example, like in Egypt, who's been occupied by the British, living right next door to somebody who was occupied by the Italians. Totally different cultures, different languages, different perspective of the world, and you can imagine that this has affected how people view themselves, how they view the world, their literature, their culture, the way they, they interact with the world at large. There is a... Uh, the, the scholars in general blame economy because basically um, the uh, countries like Great Britain, Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, France have occupied other lands in order to improve their economy. And so th there is economy on one side of the scale and there is culture and, and people and identity on the other side of the scale. And I think this is a very, very critical um, issue to look at closely now. Uh, and re-examine again, trying to, to see whether or not we have actually crossed the threshold of, of colonialization. Because if we're talking globalization, we're talking about different cultures or a, a global culture that is trying to impose ideas or um, consumer uh, uh, attitudes and so on, on different kinds of people who might not have that within them. So for example, in Egypt, one of the things that is being marketed heavily is international schooling. And that is definitely affecting how children see them themselves. You study in a different language in every part of the world. You study your own language until maybe you're nine or sometimes 12 in other countries. In Egypt, some of the, of the schools start teaching in English, French, Italian, German at age three. 
And you can imagine how that is affecting identity and how that is affecting the mother tongue of those children. Um, I saw this, another map that really changed the way I look at things. This one. You see Africa, but look closely inside the borders of Africa. What do you see? This is actually how huge Africa is. Those are some of the major Western countries in size, scaled. So actually Africa is as big as all these countries combined. China, the United States, France, Germany, Italy, and so on. This really, really changed my perspective when I saw this map. So all these political dynamics definitely affected how people perceive themselves and live their everyday lives and interact with the world at large. When you feel you own your country, it's a totally different attitude. You act very differently from when you feel you are slave labor for somebody else. Um, the effects of these occupations of Egypt are still, un until now, are still visible. Some of them are very good, such as Egypt being a melting pot of a lot of cultures, uh, being a cosmopolitan uh, place, very welcoming to different cultures. People speak languages. This is the, the good impact. But the bad impact is, for example, the language, as I just explained, and a, a serious identity crisis that we have had to go through for several decades, and we'll talk about that a little bit further. Down the same line, I personally refuse to accept certain labels. I think labels contribute, you know, I'm a communicator, and definitely um, uh, stereotyping is, is definitely one of the things that, uh, that I really focus on. And I think accepting or rejecting labels really changes how you see yourself and your world. And so we all say the Middle East. But actually, Middle East of who? Who invented that term? Who invented the Middle East? And who is the standard point that we can actually measure the rest of the world based on? This is one of my articles in Sweden last month. You can search it online, uh, Google who invented the Middle East, and you'll have it in Swedish, English, and German, where I explore the history of that term and whether or not we should accept it. I personally think I don't. And I think that uh, with all the changes that are taking place in our world now, it's excellent time for us to look at those labels and find more fair terms. To, to address uh, geography or ethnicity or a language or religion, but not from uh, uh, you know, uh, an outdated colonial perspective. Uh, this term was invented by, by Britain uh, in relation to colonial interests. It has nothing to do about geography. It has nothing. When you say North Africa, that's a geographical location. When you say the Arab world, that refers to the language. When you say the Islamic world, that refers to the religion. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you say Middle East, you're actually identifying a whole block of people, more than 350 million people, in relation to a specific nation. Why? So this is one label. The other label is Third World. That was a term invented during the Cold War, and it referred to people who, countries who were neither in the American camp or the Soviet camp. If you were in neither camp, you became Third World. It had nothing to do with the level, level of your life or education or whether or not you were civilized or not. And so accepting those labels and raising children to see themselves within those frames is very serious because if you bring up a child thinking they are inferior, thinking that they don't compare to the so-called first world, thinking that their identity is only defined in relation to another country, then that is definitely a very different type of person from a child who is raised in a country like Sweden, where they see themselves as Swedish. And that's it. Think about that. I mean, this is one way I'm looking at things and, and trying to, to think about it and, and explore. We basically need to realize that what the world media and politicians are doing to, to children of my part of the world is actually framing them, putting them in a negative frame and assuming that they have less human potential because of where they are located, because of how they are educated, because of who they are. So you actually, you have a child who has all the potential in the world like every other child, but they grow into a frame that there is a ceiling to the expectations. There is a ceiling to their abilities. 
And that is a very dangerous way of, of looking at things, if you ask me. We really need to, to be more fair, uh, addressing children of the world equally and offering them equal opportunities to achieve and to contribute to the whole world, not only to their own environment. Um, if we look at the evolution of the Egyptian identity, we'd see that, um, as I told you, we have always been occupied, more or less. And so, since 1952, when we had allegedly been independent from England, uh, we, the identity started with the resistance against occupation, with patriotism and sacrifice and higher ideals. And then it evolved to pan-Arabism during um, Nasser's time. And then eventually to nationalistic feelings during Sadat's time and after the October War. And then infatuated subordination to the West during Mubarak's time. And now regaining national pride through the revolution and with it national identity. And that's very important, resulting in challenging foreign influences, but not with the same animosity like in Nasser's time or inferiority as in, in Mubarak time. It's more like on an equal footing as equally free and civilized human beings. So we are now at a time when the young Arab people are finally regaining their self-esteem after centuries of humiliation and confused identity. And finally, realizing that they do have potential and that their potential is huge, and that they do have impact not only on themselves and their immediate environment and their region, but perhaps globally. Do you know that over the past year, since the beginning of the Arab Spring, people have demonstrated on every inhabited continent of the world, in more than 80 countries and 900 cities across the world, borrowing themes from Tahrir Square, and echoing exactly the same demands as the Egyptian people, freedom and social justice. The world was surprised and we were surprised as well. We didn't think that we had this much influence and this much power. So something is happening now that could definitely contribute to, to a, a much better uh, global orientation towards e each other and towards uh, a, a better conception of our whole world. Um, There is a critical factor that is still missing, though, to, to complete the picture and to make, uh, you know, to, to increase and, and realize the potential of ju the children of my part of the world. Education. Education previously, under the combined grip of colonialism and dictatorship, was actually used to erode people's potential. Education was changed from being a system for information, for growing character, for, for building a human being, into a system for a limiting potential, removing every possibility of innovation and creativity from the curriculum and only producing slaves. So in, in education across the Arab worlds, not only in Egypt, we don't have research, we don't study thinking skills, we don't go to the library, so try to imagine a teenager, for example, who has no critical thinking and who has never delivered a research paper in their life, who had never visited a library. What are they capable of believing? How, how, how easy it is to just you know, push them in any direction, make them believe anything and do anything with them. And right now we are realizing the dangers of this and trying very hard to, to you know, put our foot down and change these factors. But this hasn't always been the case. Education has actually been part of the heritage, particularly in Egypt, for more than 7,000 years. This is from the wall of one of the ancient Egyptian monuments, and you can see a boy and a girl sitting learning, writing, learning to write. And this is from 2500 BC. This is a girl in Egypt in 1905. And you can see she's sitting learning to read and write, contrary to the popular belief that women are not allowed to read or they are not allowed to, to be educated. This is in 1905. This is in 1920. This is a, an imam in a mosque. And you can see boys and girls sitting together, not segregated, together. And the imam is teaching them to read and to write and to recite Quran and to read poetry and to learn um, uh, um, uh, mathematics, this is the basic education that children got, this is sort of a preschool kind of preparation before they went to school. So this is what kids did 
uh, until age seven. So from, from age three, for example, until age seven, every day they went and, and, and learned, uh, and that is back in 1920. So the, what the children, the children's participation in the revolution and the way they have changed and evolved despite the deliberate destruction to their abilities and to the education system was very, very astonishing for me. They have managed to find a way around it and not only use that to their advantage, they had actually revived the Egyptian spirit all over the nation and you will see that uh, in the coming slides. So we're going to be talking about the Egyptian <laughs> children of the revolution and it started with the parents and the role of the parents is always very critical in, in, in shaping the identity of, of their children. Can you believe there was a nursery in Tahrir during the 18 days in, in January and February? Nursing babies, mom, moms brought nursing babies to a revolution. And the teachers started a makeshift nursery so a mother could bring the baby, leave them to play around a little bit or nap, and go and demonstrate, and then go and pick up her baby and go home. This was one of the things that happened in Tahrir. When I asked some of the parents whether they are afraid, why did they did this, they told me this is an, a life-changing experience that has to be experienced, not told. So many of the parents, actually I've met some parents who have come from abroad, especially, brought their children, I mean in the dangers of a revolution, took a plane, flew into Cairo, and took their children to Tahrir Square to try freedom firsthand. I do respect very much parents who would do that to, to affect the development and the, and the, and the character of, of their children. Children have shown exceptional uh, social responsibility as well. We don't have recycling, for example, in Egypt. The idea is unheard of. Of course, there are a lot of activists who are trying to, to make people used to that, but we don't have that. Children started a recycling station in Tahrir. They started a cleaning up campaign. You know, Tahrir Square is a huge square, really, really big. Um, in, in some of the mass demonstration times, it takes up to two million people, so you can imagine how big it is. And, and young people were the ones who were collecting trash and cleaning up the place. They participated in beautification campaigns all over Egypt, not only in Cairo, which meant that they um, collected donations from their neighbors and from the passers-by on the street and bought paint, for example, to paint sidewalks and draw graffiti on the walls to make them beautiful because they looked very dull. And you will see some of that. Um, here, let, let me, you know, instead of telling you stories, let me show you a video. With some of my footage, I went to Tahrir with my camera, uh, took pictures and videos. So let me t uh, show you a quick video of what the children were capable of doing during the revolution.
This was the sign that greeted me at the airport um, when I was coming back from the States to, to give lectures about the revolution. As soon as the revolution ended, when I landed in Cairo airport, I found this um, sign. Uh, the soundtrack to this video is, is a song called Tomorrow or Bukra, uh, and it's a song made by Quincy Jones for the Arab Spring with uh, 60 um, Arab uh, uh, singers. Um, very much like We Are the World that he did in the 80s, and I'm going to be putting it on my Facebook for anybody who wants it. Um, this definitely had a, a big effect, their par kids' participation in the revolution had a big effect on many things. First of all, children spontaneously started using Arabic again as a spontaneous expression of ownership and of self-identity, of, of their pride, of their identity. On Facebook and Twitter, for example, we were only using English myself included. And then suddenly, during the revolution, for no particular reason, everybody was writing in Arabic again, to the extent that our non-Arabic speaking friends were asking translation to be able to understand what was going on. Um, there was a burst of innovation and creativity all over the place, and also a burst of research and, and scientific achievement among young people. Um, these are two young Egyptians. The boy is uh, 18 years old. He won NASA's Space Lab contest two months ago, and uh, his um, experiment is going to be performed in space and uh, uh, shown live on YouTube later this year. I'll, I'll put that on my Facebook as soon as we know the date, so if, you can, if you'd like to watch live. This was unheard of before. Our kids had never excelled in science before. Uh, the girl is 16 years old, and she won an international contest uh, sponsored by the EU. She has discovered uh, a new method of producing ethanol, biofuel from waste plastic and she has won the first prize uh, among hundreds of international students from all over the world and this is only a few months after the revolution uh, had started and after kids had started realizing the sky's the limit they, they really can be achievers um, another very interesting thing that really caught my attention football or sports in general are is used as a distraction from politics, from political participation in my parts of the world. Under dictatorships, this is the one thing you can vent in. So this is the one thing, the one time that we could, for example, use our national flag when the national football team was playing. Um, what, what the Egyptian youth has managed to do is actually turn football into the most involved political participation uh, method because they use the huge fan base of football teams to form what we call the ultras 
fans of football and they are involved, they are a major component of the demonstrations all over Egypt because they are organized, because they have their chance and because they are young people with a lot of energy. So instead of turning hooligans, for example, what they actually do is lead the nation to demand their rights, something I've, I've never seen anywhere else. Uh, to the extent that a 14-year-old uh, football fan called Anas was unfortunately murdered in, in one of the very unfortunate incidents uh, happening at a stadium uh, in last February uh, by, by some of the thugs, the hired thugs from the previous regime. When he died, his will was found, a 14-year-old writing a will before going to a football match, <laughs> and his will said that he donates his organs to people who have been injured in the revolution. This level of awareness and, and, and civil involvement has never been heard of in Egypt before, let alone at this age. Kids on social media as well are doing a huge role. Um, one of the, of the groups I'm following is called A Revolution Without an ID. Uh, kids under 18 years of age have started a group on Facebook to teach each other politics until they can issue an ID to be able to vote at 18. So when you go there, you would see them uh, discussing the constitution, discussing um, different political thoughts, uh, processes, uh, discussing their dreams of being politicians at age 14, 15, 16, which is amazing because definitely their parents were not allowed to do that and nobody in their environment had taught them to do that. And so they have developed this uh, sense of awareness very, very quickly and they're using it on the right track. Um, one of the most significant changes and very touching changes for me resulting from the revolution is that marginalized Egyptians have regained their right to dream. Uh, my talk at the, at the Royal Palace focused about learning from simple, underprivileged, mostly uneducated Egyptians who are not ignorant, who are maybe uneducated formally, but who are actually uh, an incredible source of, of learning and inspiration. Um, one of the street kids, we have many of those uh, in Egypt, unfortunately, those are kids who are homeless, who are just on the street. One of the street kids decided that he wanted to be the president of the street kids. And he has a presidential program complete with designing a home for homeless children in the desert that looked like Tahrir Square, and what's, which, is, which, which has a job to rehabilitate those kids to be accepted back in mainstream society. I could not believe myself when I heard the boy talk on Egyptian TV with, with the light in his eyes, with the big smile and with the determination to be, to be somebody who is actually dragging those kids out of their poverty and, and misfortune into normal life. And, and when the interviewer asked him, why do you want to be the president of the street kids in particular? He said, because they need somebody who knows their problems. And we don't think politicians know we exist. That's a level of awareness I never imagined existed before. Um, so in, in general, Egyptian children are now forming an independent identity. They, they see themselves as who they really are with their culture in the background and their own identity. Uh, visible. They, they're no longer, it's no longer detrimental to their self-respect and self-esteem to be respected by somebody else first. They're actually building their own respect with their own hands. And this is something wonderful to, to, to be involved in. Um, I teach, uh, volunteer to teach character building to teenagers uh, to enforce this, this um, uh, positive change among, among youngsters in Egypt. And they are teaching me a whole lot. As, as we discuss and talk and do games together and workshops and so on. To the extent that the whole world has jokes about how they see the world. So you'd see maps of the world as seen by Americans, for example, and in, a, in a cartoon's way. And suddenly an Egyptian cartoonist has a way of looking at the world from an Egyptian perspective. You can see where Egypt is located. It says action, <laughs> because that's what, what we have most of all, excuse me here. And then the rest of the world, for example, Madagascar has the, <laughs> has the lion and, and Australia has an inverse sheep. <laughs> so, <laughs> and of course you can see here Canada with, with uh, take one passport, get one free. 
because of a lot of uh, people <laughs> immigrating to Canada. And I asked my Egyptian friends to tell me how their children have participated in the revolution, those inside Egypt and those outside Egypt, because a lot of uh, Egyptians are living abroad. And here is one example, for example. This is the child of a friend of mine from Canada. And suddenly she woke up one day and she found that he had done Lego flags of Egypt and Syria in support. And he asked her to take a picture to put on her Facebook to show that he is in solidarity with the Egyptian and the Syrian revolutions. Another uh, friend's son, who is 12, had suddenly started a poetry blog. He had never written poetry before. He had never written anything before. And suddenly he started writing poetry and in Arabic. This is really difficult. So he surprised his mom one day. I'm writing poetry and I have a blog for it. And he showed her the poems. Um, an eight-year-old friend of mine, uh, mine's son, uh, who lives in the States, he's an Egyptian-American, wrote this and asked his mom to share on Facebook. I'm going to read for you. He wrote, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. I went to the finals for you. I won a cup for you. I'm going to go to a new school for me and you. I promise I will win for you. Not just me, but all the Egyptians in the world are fighting for you for a better future and a better Egypt. This is for democracy and freedom from the chains of the army. Politics is fighting, education is fighting, and sports is fighting for you. Those who are lazy on Facebook, move your butt off your couch and help Egypt. <laughs> I think a lot of adults need to, need to listen to that boy. Uh, one of the cutest stories, you can see that kids from all ages are being affected and changing. One of the cutest stories is of children who are three years old, in a nursery, who have asked to have a presidential elections simulation and asked to invite the most popular presidential candidate to be the judge of those elections. Let's take a look. Those are the candidates, Mr. Elephant and Mr. Lion. <laughs> That's obviously the presidential candidate I support. If he can do this, <laughs> if he can affect children this way, then I'm definitely supporting him. Uh, this brings us to, to the importance of what we teach our children. Uh, when I was a child, um, my parents told me a, a story from Prophet Muhammad that he said to live life like a bee because it eats only good, produces only good, and if it rests on something, it doesn't break it. And that inspired me for life. I started loving nature. I loved photography and I wanted to be useful like a bee, up till today. Um, and that, um, excuse me, this is a, a picture I've taken, <laughs> and many of my pictures have bees in them for that reason. Um, and so it makes me think of what we teach our children. If we are thinking about Disney stories, for example, I think princess stories are teaching girls a lot of negative values. To depend on luck and beauty to snare a wealthy suitor, to rescue them from their fate, um, and to, to just sit there idly. All you have to do is be pretty in order for you to, to snare a guy to, to take care of you. Um, Cinderella comes home at midnight. Sleeping Beauty is lazy, sleeps all the time. <laughs> Snow White lives with seven guys. Superman wears his underwear on top of his clothes. Batman drives at, at breakneck speeds. So if you think about it, what exactly are we trying to teach those kids? We really, we really need something a bit more realistic, maybe, that, <laughs> that looks like this. And when I asked some of my um, Egyptian um, parents, uh, friends, I asked them whether they like what, what kids are learning from cartoons and, and kids' literature that is being passed around in Egypt at the moment, which, which is mostly translated from other cultures. Uh, I found that they were very unhappy and, and they would rather have localized, not only localized, but actually um, uh, local stories and, and literature uh, to, to enrich the, the way children uh, think about themselves and, and build their identity. And so someone has already started something like that, which is quite interesting. That's a new cartoon series called The 99, and it's a value-based cartoon. So the 99 superheroes, these are superheroes, and he had actually managed to get involved with, with the real superheroes, the, the company that, that runs the real cartoons with Superman and Batman and so on. So the 99 have actually 99 superheroes, and each of them is a value. And so they, they are entertaining for kids, and at the same time, 
they are based on, on specific values. This one is called Nura, which means in Arabic it means light. Um, I think it's, of course, important to teach kids about their own identity, but at the same time, it's very important also to focus on, on a globalized identity in order for them to respect diversity uh, and, and be tolerant and, and so on. And this is where it comes to one of my projects in, in 2006 when uh, the project is called Talk to Me. Some of you might remember when there were cartoons, some cartoons published in Denmark about Prophet Muhammad and, and the Muslims all over the world were offended and there was a potential serious clash uh, between religions and civilizations at that time. And this is when I started my project uh, called Don't Hate Educate. And one of the initiatives within that project was aimed at children and, teacher, and teachers. It's called Talk to Me. And it's a class project that involves uh, sending what we called a treasure box from a class in, the, in, a, in a school in Egypt to a, a class in a school in Denmark. In the treasure box, the kids would put uh, stories and cards and handicrafts and information about their own culture and received the same thing from, from the Danish kids. And then we had workshops uh, around that theme on both ends at the same time. I facilitated the communication between the teachers on, on both ends. And we have the details on the website. Uh, if you would like to, uh, to take a look, this is uh, one of the pages of our, of our website for the project. And this is the URL if you want to uh, take a look at, at, at the site. But one of the important and interesting things that happened before we started the kids' communication between each other, only the teachers had only briefed the kids on both sides uh, that there would be a project such and such, but they hadn't even started yet. There was a terrorist explosion in a small town in Cairo and some people have died. And so we received the following letter from the Danish teacher. She said that her, the, the kids asked her to write to ask about the Egyptian kids, although they haven't even met them yet. And she wrote, although the children haven't had any contact with your students yet, they felt that their personal friends in Egypt were in danger. Such a tiny contact, a name, a first letter, and all of a sudden, personal relations are made, and the world is a better place. So this is one of the, one of the results we had, uh, we had had through my project. Um, this was back in 2006, but now after the revolution, I think the Egyptian children are ready to make a huge difference for themselves, for their region, the Arab world, and North Africa, and also maybe for the world. Uh, now that they are learning many new concepts, such as freedom and democratic practices, those are also excellent themes for future literature that we had never had a chance uh, to teach our children before. Um, ch children of previous generations have experienced emotional dislocation because of the, 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 the identity crisis they had to go through. They didn't know who they were, whether they were British or Egyptian or French or what exactly were they. But right now, um, the, the children are, are getting over that and regaining the ownership of their country and regaining their national pride and their self-image and identity. And that definitely has to be reflected in the new literature offered to those children from now on in order to maximize their potential and their impact on their environment and, and the rest of the world. Um, perhaps we should, I think, you know, I think creatively, I'm not afraid to dream. So I'm wondering if we should maybe start a project where the kids themselves tell us what, how to teach them. Because they are evolving at such a speed that I don't think even adults could keep up with. So maybe if we, in a creative way, involve them in, in you know, pointing out the topics that would actually interest them in order for them to grow and realize their potential, that would be a good idea, maybe around creative workshops, international gatherings, whatever. Um, you know, there are certain times when I wish that it was children who ruled the world because they haven't yet started hating. They have incredible potential. They're very creative and they can teach us a lot of things that we could have never achieved on our own. Thank you very much. These are my contacts. You're most welcome to stay in touch with me, uh, write me an email or connect with me on Facebook or Twitter. My Twitter is just my